Um, so, so I'm, St I'm Steve Machen um, from the Economics Department, uh, where I'm a professor and I direct the uh, Centre for Economic Performance. So I'm chairing tonight's, um, tonight's uh, event, which is an International Inequalities Institute event. Uh, the III uh, is an institute, which I'm, I'm, there's plenty of people from here in, in the room, I think, uh, but in case anybody doesn't know, uh, it, it, it's an institute here uh, which has a bunch of experts from different uh, LSE departments and centres uh, working on uh, a range of issues using a range of methodologies uh, to study the way that um, um, inequality uh, is rising in many places across the world, uh, the determinants of inequality, and linking that to, to relevant um, uh, social science and indeed wider um, policy kind of questions and issues. Um, so, so I think it's worth saying that the IIA has a few new research themes. Um, Mike Savage here at the front is uh, running one on wealth elites and tax justice. Uh, the other people can't quite see in here. Um, David Soskis uh, is, 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 is building on some of his work, uh, doing more work now on cities, jobs, and the knowledge economy. And Beverly Skaggs is working on global economics of care. <coughs> Um, so there's research going on in that, in, in that kind of area. Uh, for people who are in, again interested in this area, there's an upcoming event, uh, another event on the 28th of November, again about Chile, uh, or a connection to Chile, actually today's the board in Chile. But there's a big connection from both speakers uh, here to do, to do with Chile. So there's, there's going to be another event called Understanding Chilean, Chilean Unrest, Inequality, Social Conflict and Political Change in Contemporary Chile. Uh, uh, which I think um, is, uh, is chaired by our speaker today, uh, in a couple of weeks' time. Um, so, so on, 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 on to um, today's event. Um, I'm delighted to chair this, um, chair this uh, event today, uh, looking at labour markets from a multidimensional perspective, uh, with a particular focus on South America, uh, but quality of employment in South America. So we're delighted to have Kirsten Schenbrecht, Senbrook, sorry, as, um, as, as our speaker today. Kirsty's um, a British Academy Global Professor right now um, here and a Distinguished Policy Fellow at, based at the International Inequalities Institute at the LSC. Uh, previously, she's worked at the University of Chile. Uh, she's um, been, been a lecturer at the University of California at Berkeley um, as well. Um, and her work uh, is uh, focused on issues to do with measurement of um, the quality of jobs, employment in developing countries, um, and tonight's talk is going to present, be presenting um, various pieces of material from lots of papers she's written um, on, on, on the subject. Um, our, our discussion today, uh, we're very pleased to have um, Professor Andres Velasco, the inaugural uh, Dean of the School of Public Policy um, at, at, at the LSE. Uh, he's previously held professorial positions at, um, at, in Harvard, Columbia, uh, New York, and uh, for everybody who knows, I think he was the um, finance minister <laughs> in Chile for, for a little while, anyway. <laughs> um, so I'm delighted to have um, these two speakers. I think it should be, it should be a, great, um, a, great, a, a great event. Um, there's um, uh, the Twitter hashtag. Is it up there? Um, but the Twitter hashtag for the event, if anybody, anybody wants to tweet stuff around, is, is um, hashtag LSE knowledge. LSE and, and the K for knowledge are in capitals, the rest of the knowledge is in, in lowercase uh, letters. Um, so what we're going to do, uh, we're going to begin with the speaker who's going to speak for about 45 minutes. We'll have a 10 to, min 10 to 15 minute um, response uh, by our discussant, and then we'll <laughs> open up for a Q&A session um, to the floor. So I'm delighted to invite our speaker, uh, Kirsty. Um, Thank you. So just before I begin, um, I'd like to say that this is not just my work that I'm presenting, but also the work of my wonderful team, many of whom are in Chile, but Rocio Mendes is with us tonight, and I have her to thank for many late nights of producing graphs and data and calculation, without which I would not be standing here. So thank you, Rocio, and thank you to all the others who can't be here today. Um, I'm going to try and convince you of a few things today. I'm going to argue in general, that the quality of employment is important and that in particular public policy should focus on this issue in a, in a way that it hasn't been doing until now. I'm also going to try and tell you that because it isn't measured, 
you don't manage what you don't measure, the old adage. Um, we often make policies without bearing in mind the reality of labour markets. And so therefore, measuring the quality of employment would help. And I'm going to present a particular methodology for doing so. I'm also going to argue that social protection and the quality of employment are two sides of the same coin. And this may sound very obvious and um, you know, like nothing special um, at first glance, but I can tell you a story of a finance minister in Chile once, not Andres, another one, um, who once said to me when I tried to convince him that the quality of jobs was important, that the type of jobs was important, um, when he was doing a pension reform, and that maybe he should think about the kind of labour market he has uh, before doing the reform, I got the response that, don't ask me to think about two things at the same time. I'm doing a pension reform that has nothing to do with labour markets. So we had one pension reform and then another, and we've had various social security system reforms or social protection reforms that don't really think about employment characteristics and therefore at the end of the day we shouldn't be too surprised when they don't work and those of you who have been following recent events in Latin America um, probably have heard that that's probably one of the big explanatory factors of what is happening at the moment certainly in the case of Chile. I'm also going to argue that active labour market policies which are often put forward as a solution to many labour market problems in developing countries aren't going to work under current labour market conditions or employment conditions. Um, in particular, any investment in skills and productivity is going to be difficult in labour markets where formal employment is highly precarious. Finally, it's also very difficult to prepare for the impact of future technologies, artificial intelligence, etc., when labour markets are very precarious and when you can't do the previous steps. Now, hopefully some policy solutions exist to this, and hopefully we'll get some time to discuss them at the end. Um, that's going to be Andres's job, apart from some very few suggestions on my part. Um, just a quick overview. I'm going to give you some introductory considerations about the subject, where this is all coming from, where we stand at the moment. I'm then going to move from the micro level to the macro level by giving you some examples from Chile uh, to show why the quality of employment is important and how it interacts with social protection systems. And then I'll move on to a proposal that measures the quality of employment in 15 Latin American countries. And hopefully this methodology can be extended to other developing regions in the world. I will be following the Alkaya Foster method for those of you who are familiar with the multidimensional poverty measurement. Um, that's the method that is used, used to measure that. And I shall be following that um, step by step, pretty much. I'll share some results about what the indicator would look like and come to policy conclusions. Now, how we traditionally think about labour markets, we may think about labour markets beyond these indicators, these traditional indicators of the participation rate, unemployment rates, and vulnerable employment. But the problem with, um, e even if we do think beyond them, we don't really have international publications that generate data that allow us to compare other variables. So traditionally, if you look at world employment outlooks, if you look at uh, publications, for example, recently the uh, UNDP published a World Development, Human Development Report on labor markets, and really they didn't uh, put together any new information on labor markets. So you continuously come across various variations on the theme, different types of participation rates, unemployment rates, disaggregated by gender, for young people, etc., and something called vulnerable employment, which the ILO tends to call informal sector. And I've uh, just listed these indicators here. For women, they tend to be worse. There tends to be lower participation rates for women, sometimes higher unemployment rates, sometimes more vulnerable employment. I'm using the definition here very deliberately of the World Bank because it gives us a very clear understanding of the most vulnerable workers in a labor market, the self-employed and non-remunerated family workers who are, who are also working, um, for the simple reason that it's a very, very, very clear cut statistic, and I'll come back to that in the course of the presentation. But this is what we normally have when we think about labor markets in developing countries. We also look at wages sometimes, um, but we really don't think about what types of jobs people have. So why is the quality of employment important? Well, I've mentioned that a little bit in the introduction. I'll show you two very quick illustrations from uh, two papers that we did on the Chilean pension system 
and also on its unemployment insurance system. The difference between the two papers is that one uses survey data, which is available for a longer period of time, but is probably not as reliable. The other is administrative data, which has its own problems, but um, gives us a very real overview of what is going on currently in a labour market. I'm not going to go into this terribly complicated graph, except to say that it summarises the behaviour in the labour market of the first cohort of people who were covered by Chile's privatised pension system. So from the 1980s, when it was first implemented, um, the, the private pension funds were implemented. Those people who have contributed to the system <coughs> for 30 years come out with employment trajectories or employment histories which really weren't anticipated by the pension system which, when it was originally set up. So when the system was set up, people expected, were expected to work in the same job for a relatively long period of time. There were certain wage expectations, uh, and it was expected that people would contribute to the system. Well, really here, the only, only the reg seg segment um, is the sort of conventional work-life trajectory that we can see from this data. The other colours and categories are people who really who are not contributing in the same way as was expected when the system was originally implemented. And therefore, as a result, <coughs> at the end of the day, you have more than 50% of the labour force which really hasn't contributed to the pension system in the way it was, that was expected when it was set up. And so as a result of that, of course, you have pensions that are much, much lower than was originally expected. Over those 30 years, much has happened in the Chilean labour market. Employment relationships have become much shorter and they've become um, perhaps more formal, but those formal relationships have also become more flexibilized in the sense that people are hired more frequently on short-term contracts. And what this looks like with administrative data is illustrated by the following um, little table, which is from the unemployment insurance system. So, if you go back to this original table that I had about vulnerable employment, you can see that Chile is one of the countries here um, with 22.8% vulnerable employment. So you'd think that the other jobs are relatively good given this piece of information. But the problem is that those formal jobs, the ones that contribute to, a, to in this case, the unemployment insurance system, 30% um, of them are based on short-term contracts. The first two lines show you that people rotate in and out of the labour market very, very frequently. So this is an unemployment insurance system that, which was imp implemented relatively recently and it's already got more than twice as many members who are affiliated to the system than are currently contributing. So that gives you an idea of how frequently people fluctuate from employment into inactivity or other activities that are not captured by a formal social protection system. Well, 30% of the workers have short-term contracts. On average, those contracts, this is the second red arrow, last about 10 months. 50% of those contracts don't even last three months. So there may be issues here with the data, but on average, people are rotating between different jobs in the, um, in, in the insurance system. And in between those jobs, on average, the workers who have short-term contracts do not contribute for about six months. So that's where this idea comes from that about half of the time people aren't really contributing and that therefore the benefits that you accumulate are much reduced compared to what um, was initially expected by the system. At the end of the day, the people who become unemployed are of course the most vulnerable workers. So people with fixed term contracts are pretty much pre-programmed to become unemployed at some point. And they are therefore also the people who haven't accumulated enough funds in the system to then be covered by it. So of the workers who become unemployed, about 20% only request unemployment insurance. 5% have a right to the risk sharing component within that system, at least theoretically. And of those, only 2.4% of the unemployed, the people who stop contributing to this system, actually receive a solidarity. Um, payment. So that's really what a social protection system looks like in a labour market um, that isn't really functioning as this system originally intended. When this was designed, I was doing a PhD um, in Chile and had information on some of these variables that are relevant to the design of this system. And the Minister of Labour at the time invited me to present this information and I rather naively 
um, told him that given the data that I had, the system wasn't going to cover the unemployed. Um, the presentation ended very quickly after that, and uh, I afterwards heard that they basically said, well, it's only survey data, it's going to happen. Once this is working, it'll happen, it'll, it'll work. And then about a year later, I was called in um, to one of the advisors from the minister, and they showed me the printouts from the system, from the actual administrative data, and said, um, we have 80% of the people contributing to the unemployment insurance system who have short-term contracts and who therefore will not be covered by the system. There's something wrong here. So really, when this was designed, there was very little information on the Chilean labor market, on the employment histories of people who were contributing to um, social protection systems or not, as the case may be, what type of contracts they had, how this interacted with wage, le wage levels. All of this was pretty much one big black box of unknown variables. And so, of course, when this unemployment insurance system was designed, you had very little idea of how this would work out in practice. So that's why looking at job characteristics and the quality of employment is important. Now, we've always known that informal workers who don't contribute to social security systems are a problem for any government that has to end up making contributions, for example, from fiscal coffers, coffers to support people who are either poor or who don't have a minimum pension, etc. But really, the point here is that formal employment has also become much, much more precarious than it was originally assumed. And because this hasn't been measured in a systematic way over a long period of time, this kind of passed under the radar, and that's how we get pension systems and unemployment insurance systems that don't work very well. Now, traditionally, the assumption is, of course, that a formal job is a good job. And I just want to emphasize again the fact that international reports on employment and labor markets, especially with developing countries when they're looking at a large range of countries, they don't look at types of contract. They don't look at employment durations. They sometimes look at social security coverage, but they don't ever put these variables together. So the other point that comes from this is also that it, it makes very little sense, therefore, to look at labor markets in developing countries from this dual perspective that we've been taught for decades to look at, which is the segmentation between informal sectors and formal sectors. If the formal sectors become more precarious, then it makes much, much more sense to measure the quality of employment. Now, while there's a broad consensus now that we should be measuring the quality of employment, the big question is how? And there's been an awful lot of debate about this, very little agreement. And what I'm going to put forward now is a sort of um, a potential methodology for doing so. I just want to say that this method and this work is roughly where multidimensional poverty measurement was when Alkaya Foster started to, to publish their first papers in about 2007. Now, when it comes to measuring poverty, however, the important thing to bear in mind is that we can pretty much all agree that having more income, better health, more education, better living conditions is a good thing, right? The problem with the quality of employment is that there's no such obvious consensus. So we can probably more or less agree that more wages are better, for individual workers at least, perhaps not for companies. But on pretty much every other variable, there will, there will be differences of opinion. Some workers will want to contribute to social protection systems, others may not. The state probably wants them to contribute. Employers care more about productivity, wages, etc. Um, workers will have other priorities, and unions have an entirely different set of priorities. So that's kind of how we got to this conundrum, because the ILO launched its concept of decent work in 1999, which is quite a long time ago. But they launched it without a specific definition. They launched it with a, with a very sort of broad, all-encompassing definition of rights. And um, it sounded very flowery and very nice at the time. But there was no specific concept about how this was supposed to be measured. There was no measurement that they proposed. And there was no available data with which to measure decent work. And they went back and forth for many, many, many years because the original expectation was that they would measure decent work. But by 2008, this debate had become so complex and so conflicted that they actually had a big international conference and decided that they wouldn't measure decent work, that it was supposed to be just a concept. Um, and they proposed a serious and a rather long list of indicators that would um, constitute decent work. 
That list of variables and indicators consists of 52 different variables. So any policymaker who's ever tried to make a policy based on 52 different variables, um, well, good luck, it's not really going to work. But it's not just the ILO that has had difficulties with this, it's also other developed countries. The EU has had a very similar debate, hasn't been able to come to a conclusion, but at least in the case of the EU, they have a coherent set of data um, in the form of the European Working Conditions Survey, which has some problems, but at least it asks a very broad range of questions. As a result of which people think about the quality of employment in Europe as a whole range of things, and very rarely summarize them up in a single indicator, but at least they are talking about it with specific measures in hand. At the end of the day, though, the EU couldn't agree either on a definition of job quality and commissioned the OECD to produce an indicator and paid them to do so. But even the OECD couldn't bring itself to produce a synthetic indicator of job quality, and I'll explain in a minute what that looks like and what, how that works, because they didn't want to rank countries. So governments are very, very resistant to being ranked on the issue of um, job quality, and they ended up producing something called a dashboard, which I'll also explain. More recently, the Inter-American Development Bank has produced an indicator for Latin America, but it uses only macro indicators, as does the OECD indicator, so not individual-based um, information that can't be used by policymakers for targeting, for example. And uh, they basically used the existing information that was already available, participation rates, wages, etc., and put them into an indicator. Academics have made numerous attempts to resolve this, and as you can imagine, there are about 50 different proposals out there. They're all different. In developing countries, some studies exist on the quality of employment, but they're all individual country-based, so they're not really looking at a group of countries. This is the OECD index. The important thing here is that this generated a consensus in that earnings quality was considered to be important, as was job security, and the quality of the work environment. And they used a range of variables to, to calculate these uh, dimensions using data that is not available in developing countries. And when they tried to replicate this methodology in 2015 with some major emerging economies, they had to use a whole series of proxies and the results didn't come out very well. But as an international institutional um, proposal goes, this constituted real progress at the time. As does the Inter-American Development Bank's Better Jobs Index, which is actually produced by James Foster himself, but ironically he didn't use his own methodology to do this, but, but that, that's another issue. He also uses macro variables, knowing how important it is to use micro variables at the individual level, but he used macro ones, um, probably because this is the easy available data. So again, we've, we're back down to labor participation rates, employment rates, the percent of formal jobs, which is what I before called vulnerable employment, and the number of workers not earning a living wage. So that's what this indicator brings together, and it ranks countries in Latin America, but again, is of little use to policymakers. So I'm going to propose an alternative, which uses the Alcaire Foster method to measure job quality. I really can't talk to any, in, in any great detail about why I'm using the capability approach as a theoretical framework for this. That's an, an entirely different paper um, that we're working on at the moment. But really, as I'm following the steps of multidimensional <coughs> poverty measurements, very much the same arguments as apply when it comes to measuring the quality of employment. Um, because the existing literature also lacks a theoretical framework, the capability approach can fulfill a very useful purpose in this, in this context. The most important thing about the capability approach, of course, is that it focuses on individuals and within the group of individuals on the most vulnerable. So that's also what this indicator um, pretends to reflect. Now, Asen, of course, himself also discusses employment very much in, in his work but it tends to be a sort of tangential issue that produces resources. It's the, it's the what you can do with the results from employment um, that, that he looks at more often than not. And al Qaeda, as a result, defines employment as a missing dimension in the capability approach. So if you look at the capability approach literature in recent decades, you will find literally tons of papers on education and capabilities, health and capabilities, children and capabilities. There, there are all sorts of um, themes that come up again and again. 
If you look for employment and capabilities, you won't find that much, and trust me, I have looked. Um, but it's now coming a little bit sort of to the forefront of the debate, and there's some recognition of the fact that this is a missing dimension that has, even though it was classified as a missing dimension, not been worked on. In any case, um, if you really think about employment from the perspective of the capability approach, say, for example, if you think about Nussbaum's list of 10 capabilities, then really, again, you end up with a very much with an all-encompassing approach, very much with a big picture um, that considers every dimension and aspect of employment, which of course is incredibly difficult to operationalize. So if you think about Nussbaum's list of capabilities, pretty much every single one of them is, can be related to employment. So life, health, bodily well-being, that's all very much related to your employment conditions, whether they're safe, whether they affect your health. Um, your senses, imagination, creativity, thought process, that's also very much a product of the type of job that you have, as are your social relationships, your social status, your sense of affiliation, of contributing to, to society, and so on. These are all dimensions that are very, very difficult to measure, full stop, but they're particularly difficult to measure in a developing country, and we have no data on them so far. So. Again, what we're doing here, or what I'm doing with this methodology, is I'm taking the broad approach, I have a whole theoretical framework based on the capability approach, but then when it comes to operationalizing it, we need to narrow it down and see what data do we have and how can we best use that data in order to reflect the capabilities that come from employment. And at the end of the day, again, this focuses, or this follows the approach used by um, the people who developed the human development approach by Sen and um, Mabub ul -Haq at the time when they developed the HDI. ul -Haq argued that we need a measure of the same level of vulgarity as GNP, only a number, but a measure which is not as blind to the social aspects of human life as GNP. So think about that statement. You can apply that to labor markets, to the unemployment rate, and to all those aspects of employment that are neglected if you just look at the unemployment rate. So my dream, as dreams go, is that one day there will be a newspaper headline that says not just unemployment rate X percent, but unemployment rate X percent and underneath quality of employment indicator X. So the important thing is that at some point we need to get to the point where we look at both sides at the same point. Now, how we define this is we very much followed the OECD approach in order to operationalize this. This is a big jump from the capability approach, but this is sort of coming down to the data level. The OECD did us the big favor of generating a consensus about what is important and what is not, and we've taken the same three dimensions, more or less, employment conditions, labor market, income, labor income, and employment stability. And we've taken the five indicators that in the Latin American region we can compare across countries to serve as indicators in these dimensions. So in labor income, for example, of course we have the absolute income from the main occupation. We tried to follow the OECD and use relative income, but in countries, in a group of countries that are so highly unequal as the Latin American countries are, that produced very odd results, so that didn't really work. We stuck to absolute income levels. In the case of employment stability, we looked at the occupational status and the tenure, so how long you are working in the same job, because that's what creates the stability and your continuity in your employment trajectory and history. And of course, your employment conditions. Now, this is really where data really um, is limited. So all we could come up with here that was comparable across the region is whether you are affiliated, not even contributing, affiliated to a social security system and the number of hours that workers work. So we're kind of using these as proxies because we know from other studies that other employment conditions such as accidents, health related um, issues are very much linked to these two variables. So think of this third dimension more as a proxy, as well as being relevant for the quality of employment itself. I'm not going to explain the Ankaya Foster method in great detail. There are three slides at the end of this presentation which do so. I'm just going to explain it as I go through the, um, uh, the explanations of how we constructed this indicator. So now that we have our dimensions and the indicators that I showed you, we have to define a cutoff line in each indicator below which we consider a worker to be deprived. 
Now, in the case of income, we would have liked to have used minimum wages, but minimum wages are set very differently across countries, and the results made little sense. Poverty lines are very limiting because they really um, are a minimal level of income, and to develop yourself in the labor market, to develop your capabilities, you need a little bit more than just being at the poverty line. So what we ended up doing is we chose six poverty, uh, sorry, food baskets as a, as a cutoff line because each worker in Latin America has on average one dependent, so one child, and so you need approximately three food baskets just to be able to function. We tested this, of course, we did robustness testing. Um, we would have liked to have used eight food baskets because that gives you more to work with in order to be able to develop in the labor market, but those results came out so high that the entire indicator wouldn't have worked. In terms of occupational status, we're focusing on those workers, um, we consider those workers to, to be deprived, who have no contract and who are self-employed, um, because these workers have no recourse to legal rights, they have no entitlements, no legal entitlements whenever there's a problem. Um, and they, of course, don't uh, contribute to Social Security either, which is also reflected in the other dimension that kind of gives it a double weighting. Now, the dimension tenure, or the indicator tenure, is the one that causes the most controversy and that we get the most questions on because we chose a cutoff line of three years. Now, one year gives you an entitlement, for example, to severance pay. If you work for 12 months, um, you can claim certain benefits in most countries or you can, you can claim severance pay. But the fact is, if you don't have the functioning unemployment insurance system, you need about three years of tenure to accumulate three months of severance pay, which covers you for about the five to six months of unemployment that um, workers on average go to, through at a replacement rate of about 50 to 60 percent. So that's how we got to the three years. Um, three years is also a point at which point um, self-employed workers are less likely to be able to go bankrupt or have to give up their business. And also after three years, it's, you're relatively more likely to stay in the same job and sort of have a stable job uh, going forwards. This condition, of course, is slightly different for younger workers there. We did take a cutoff line for, of one year. With the um, social security dimension, it's relatively obvious those workers who do not contribute are considered to be deprived in this indicator. And with working hours, we took international conventions and followed the ILO's recommendation that those workers who are working more than 45 hours a week um, will have problems with their work-life balance, stress, etc. And so that's not a good thing. So that's our cut-off line for hours. Um, Overall, you then need to bring all of these dimensions together. I'm just going to say that we take a cutoff line of 33% across these dimensions, um, pretty much for normative reasons. So um, we need you, for example, to have at least um, an appropriate level of income and, and be a, have a stable job in order to be not considered to be deprived. And we follow the outlier cluster method of calculating a headcount ratio of how many people are deprived multiplied by the intensity of deprivation, so how many dimensions or indicators are you deprived in, and that gives us the overall indicator MO. This is the same methodology as multidimensional poverty, and you can look it up at the end of the presentation if you need uh, data. So this is what the dashboard of these results looks like. I think the first interesting thing here to note is that there is no single country in the region that is overall completely bad across all indicators. And there is no country in the region that is completely good across all indicators. There is an awful lot of variation here. Some of the lower income countries are very obviously in the red zone, and some of the more developed countries are in the green zone, but there's no overall correlation here that is particularly obvious. Now, again, this would be very difficult to use if you're a policymaker. So the idea is to follow the um, Alkai Foster method and create a synthetic indicator by multiplying the overall headcount ratio, which is what you get when you have um, when you measure the number of people that are below that cutoff line of 33% across the indicator. You multiply it by the uh, intensity of deprivations, and you get the overall indicator. Now, here the results are relatively intuitive in that those countries in the region that are less developed tend to be in the red zone, and Chile comes out here as the best performer in the region, which is the, uh, it's the best country with the lowest level of deprivation. 
and in other countries the picture is more mixed. But this is what the indicator at first glance looks like overall. I'm going to skip the dimensional contributions for now because um, I don't have as much time as I thought. Just to give you an idea, if you're a policy maker, you can um, look at the distribution of, or the, you can, sorry, decompose your indicator to see where, which dimension is contributing most to your level of deprivation. So do I need to focus on income levels? Do I need to focus on employment stability? Or do I need to focus on social security, etc.? Now, we already know that women in the region have a lower participation rate. Well, guess what? If we look at the quality of employment, there's also a gender gap. There is no country in the region where women have better jobs than men. There's only Mexico where they have relatively equal levels of job quality. But in, all, in most countries, women have poorer job quality than men. You can disaggregate this in, across, across all sorts of different dimensions, economic sectors, educational levels, age groups, etc. I've just taken educational um, levels here to give you an idea. There are absolutely no surprises here. Workers with less education have lower quality jobs, and workers with higher levels of education have better quality jobs. Except to say that in some countries in the region which are less developed, even tertiary education doesn't guarantee that you will have a good job. So there are still some countries that I've marked in red, just to illustrate that point on that side. And I think this is where it gets in even more interesting. When we look at, when we think about the fact that normally or traditionally we thought of formal jobs as being the good jobs, the ones that we don't need to worry about. Well, this graph takes the six Central American countries and shows you which proportion of formal jobs are actually precarious, even though they're, 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 they're formal. These are all jobs with contracts. The lighter blue are open-ended contracts, and the darker blue are fixed-term contracts. And you can see that, of course, among the fixed-term contracts, a much, much higher proportion of those formal jobs is precarious. But even having an open-ended contract is no guarantee whatsoever of having a high quality job. This gets more interesting, when, again, when we disaggregate this by gender. If you look at the open-ended contracts, which is the lower half of this uh, graph, there doesn't seem to be that much difference between the job quality between men and women. But if you look at the fixed-term contracts, which is the top half of the slide, you find that women have a significantly higher proportion of low-quality jobs among the fixed-term contracts. So these are um, results that you would normally overlook unless you're um, looking at the quality of employment and these particular dimensions. Just looking at some relationships, um, the quality of employment as we calculated has no obvious relationship with the traditional indicators that we normally look at in the labour market. So ideally, in an ideal world, you would have a high employment rate and a low level of poor job quality. You would be hopefully somewhere up there and beyond this 30% arc. Um, you can see no countries in the region are in that part of the graph, um, but there is also no clear relationship between the employment rate and the quality of employment. The unemployment rate and the quality of employment are equally unrelated. Um, again, you would want to be in, in the sort of lower part of the graph um, sort of with low unemployment rate and a low proportion of poor quality jobs. Um, there are no countries in that area, and you can see that there are some countries which have high unemployment and poor quality jobs. So those are the ones who have the most problems or in, are in the worst situation. The quality of employment and vulnerable employment, which is the definition that we looked at before from the World Bank, however, of course, are related because the, by definition the vulnerable jobs are precarious, so they, they come um, out as being poor quality in this indicator as well. But this indicator shows us higher proportions of poor quality of employment than we get from just looking at vulnerable <coughs> employment. And the obvious reason for this is, of course, that in, um, the vulnerable employment definition doesn't take account of precariousness in formal jobs. So that's what this look, graph looks like. And since, since this is an event of the Inequalities Institute, I wanted to show you some slides also on the distribution of quality, job quality. Um, this is the graph that we tend to know about. This is the participation rate by income decile. And we've known for a very long time that participation rates in lower income households are lower than in higher income households. This is <coughs> taken four countries here, 
the two most developed and the two least developed in the southern cone, to show you how this differs um, in, in, depending on how developed the country is. But overall, in the more developed countries, there's a sort of steeper um, gradient, and in the less developed countries, it's less steep. So in the lower income deciles and the, the less developed countries, very few people can afford to not participate in the, not to participate in the labor market. With the unemployment rate, of course, it's exactly the other way around. Again, with the differences between the higher income countries in the region and the lower income countries in the region. Um, again, so you've got a double whammy of low participation rates in the lower income deciles, higher unemployment rates, and this is where, of course, you get the poorer jobs as well. So you've got a triple whammy. High participation, um, sorry, low participation, high unemployment, and poor quality jobs. The interesting thing here is, of course, that in countries like Paraguay and Bolivia, which are these two bars, um, even being in the top income decile doesn't guarantee that you will have a good job, according to this indicator. Mm -hmm. So coming to the conclusions, one obvious purpose of this indicator is to draw attention to these issues. Um, as I said before, the traditional indicators don't take account of these things. Um, I'm not arguing that the quality of employment indicator should be used instead of traditional indicators such, a, such as participation and unemployment rates. It should be used in addition to them. I think that the study, um, in particular the paper, shows that the Alkaya Foster method can be used to construct a quality of employment indicator. The results are all plausible. So there are some studies out there which come out with some absolutely fantastic results showing, for example, that Tanzania has a better labor market than Italy. So at least here the, or here the, the, the results are intuitive and follow what you would expect from what we know from the literature and from other data. It also seems that inter, at an international level we could agree on a method such as this. We're currently working on that with the UN <coughs> in, in Latin America. Of course, if you use this method for individual countries, then you have different data availability, different issues, and you could very easily adapt this methodology to the circumstances of individual countries, which is, of course, exactly what has been done with multidimensional poverty measurement. And just to say that these indicators, if you look at them over time, um, these are not quality of employment indicators do not jump around, so not in the same way as the unemployment rate would or perhaps even the participation rate would react to economic developments. Um, this is an indicator that responds primarily to regulatory changes. So looking at all of these results sort of uh, together, I think one of the uh, very obvious conclusions is, is that we have to stop looking at labor markets in developing countries, regardless where they are, in terms of this dual model of informality and formality, given how the quality of jobs in the formal sector has changed, it makes much, much more sense to look at them on a gradient scale or to look at different groups in the labor market saying these are the high quality jobs, these are the middle quality jobs and the poor quality jobs. And in developing countries, the big unknown, of course, is how technology, artificial intelligence and um, new developments will affect the quality of employment and labor markets. My suspicion is that they will pretty much explode in the middle. Um, people with high quality jobs and high levels of education will be able to adapt to no new circumstances. It's the people in the middle of the labor market and probably also at the bottom end of the scale who will have more difficulty. Having said that, if you're working in the informal sector and if you're selling orange juice in the streets, you can probably still do that in 30 years' time. The question is whether you'll be earning enough to maintain your family with that. There are, I think, some ideas that we can consider to improve job quality in the region and other developing countries. I think this starts with eliminating the differences between the different types of contracts that I showed you. Um, in particular, for example, one of the big differences is the entitlement to severance pay in the region. Um, if you, for example, regulated severance pay to have to pass through individual savings accounts that can't be paid out in a lump sum, but that have to be paid on the go, that would probably make a big difference to the segmentation that we have at the moment at the high levels of job rotation that we have between workers who have fixed term contracts and open-ended contracts. I think a really important point is 
to say not just that social protection systems can't work with labor markets that are this precarious, um, I think it's fair to say that no social protection system, no matter how it's designed, can function with a labor market like this. So I think this is a really important point. Do we want individual savings accounts? Do we want a social risk sharing system? Those are debates that are obviously very valid and very, very important to have. But I think it's fair to say that neither system will work when the um, jobs that are contributing to the system are, are so precarious and when half the time workers aren't contributing to the social protection system. I would really also hope that people would stop recommending active labour market policies as a solution to this. I don't know how many times I've heard the recommendation from international institutions that if you implement an unemployment insurance system, that will give workers the resources to create a, uh, to find a better job and to have a better match between their skills and the jobs that they find. Well, in reality, first of all, you need a functioning unemployment insurance system to, for that to happen. Um, but also, with this level of precariousness and this level of informality that continues to persist in the labour market, it is very difficult to get active labour market policies to function on a large scale and to really impact this. So you will be able to design um, programmes that work um, for a, a number of limited number of people, but really to have an overall impact on the quality of employment that will not be resolved by individual programmes. One idea is to also replace conditional cash transfer programmes with earned income tax credits. Um, the idea there being that if you had an attractive enough package, you could probably convince many workers who are not contributing to social protection systems to do so, provided they formalize and then you um, give them an earned income tax credit in return that will cover the cost of that. So that's something we can discuss um, and that I hope Andres will have some insights um, into. But very obviously also, what the, one of the final conclusions is you, we have to stop thinking about policies in separate boxes. So to think about social policies without considering labor markets, without considering vocational training, investment in productivity, investment in skills, really does not make sense in this context. Um, and hopefully this provides some thought for you know, going forwards for thinking about these policies. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, Thank you, Kirsten, for that uh, very impressive piece of work. Actually, pieces of work, because it's about 10 papers folded into one. Um, I am not quite sure why I'm standing here, because I am not a labor economist. I am not um, an inequality expert. Um, I su suppose I am a user of all this stuff. And um, you know, uh, lack of knowledge never kept anyone from participating in policy debates, and I've been very active in these policy debates in spite of my relative lack of knowledge, so I suppose that gives me some sort of uh, authorization to, uh, to react. Let me begin by saying that I am delighted that uh, Kirsten is doing this work and that she is focusing on employment, not just the quantity of employment, but the quality of employment. I think that employment in general and a focus on the quality of employment is absolutely key if we're going to be thinking in a useful and systematic way about many of those things that worry us. For instance, inequality and for instance, social policy. Um, something you said at the very end is to me the key uh, 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 to why this is important. Uh, we tend to think of um, employment over here, social policy over here, and uh, there are experts in this field who don't talk to the experts in this field. That is completely and totally counterproductive uh, and outright silly. Uh, and uh, as I will argue, you cannot really think about social policy in most places, certainly not in Latin America, unless you're talking about social policy, sorry, about employment quality and employment uh, uh, availability to begin with. Um, it's also sort of a political statement. Uh, I think way too much of the inequalities debate in Latin America has focused on wage levels, and that's perfectly fine. You know, you scratch somebody on the street, and you know, what's inequality about? Of course, it's about wage levels. But uh, people in this room will not be surprised to, to learn that in order to have a wage, you need a job. Um, uh, and that uh, just as uh, wage levels are uh, 
very unequally distributed. The access to employment is also very unequally distributed. I'm going to return to this point later. So a uh, debate about inequality, which is not a debate about labor market access, is a very poor debate indeed. This has been a sort of a long-standing obsession of mine. Uh, it is not necessarily something that is very popular. Uh, it is very easy to rant and rave about wage inequality. It is much trickier, often for technical, but as well for political reasons, to get very upset about labor market inequality or access to employment inequality. And I think that clouds not only the sort of clarity of our debates, but often the usefulness, the practical usefulness of our debates. The other reason, broadly speaking, why I like what Kirsten is doing is that um, anything that takes the capabilities approach, uh, I will, you know, be uh, um, uh, cheering on. Uh, I'm a sucker for anything Martha Nussbaum has ever done, including, parenthetically, her beautiful book on political emotions that came out a couple of years ago. Um, and I think to think, you know, I think that approaching the issue of um, of a quality of employment from a capabilities approach is, is very fruitful for at least two reasons. One is that um, if one is to take seriously uh, Sen's statement that uh, you know, capabilities uh, are all about allowing people to lead the lives they want to lead, not simply the lives that they were dealt, well, um, fulfillment is very much related uh, 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 and the right or well, the possibility of leading an autonomous and fulfilling life is very much related to uh, the job you have and the quality of the job you have. And secondly, if we're going to go measure these things and we're going to have a reliable, say, index of human development, an index of human development that does not cover both the availability and the quality of employment, this is also a point you make, is going to be a very partial and not very informative index of human development. So I am all for uh, enriching those measures that we have out there with uh, information about uh, the quality of employment. So on general grounds, uh, uh, I am very much for what Kirsten and co-authors uh, are doing. Let me ex uh, express uh, two, um, three doubts uh, about exactly how we go about this. And these are doubts and criticisms because I'm not quite sure uh, that I know what I would do instead, but let me just raise the issues and then I want to spend some time talking about the policy implications. Uh, doubt number one has to do with um, how we think about rotation and job tenure uh, in the modern world. You know, we, we were all brought up to think that a good labor market was one in which you know, you graduated from either high school or university, you got a job and you stayed in that job more or less until you were 65, you retired and all was well. Um, there are many reasons why that old dream is going uh, out the window. Um, of course, that was never really the reality for much uh, of the labor force in Latin America. But forget about Latin America or developing countries, this is very much uh, also going out the window for other reasons in rich countries, right? Um, uh, I'll give you one number from Chile that, uh, that uh, may be il illustrative of this. Um, if you believe Chilean labor market statistics, Chile historically had something like 75,000 taxi drivers of the old-fashioned kind, um, driving little yellow and black cars, which is what they are in Chile. Uber and Cabify came to Chile, and with its, within six months, you had twice as many Uber drivers as you had regular taxi cab drivers. Twice as many in six months. So the advent of the new technologies has changed the nature of the labor market hugely. And in that context, I'm not quite sure what job tenure means anymore, why a three-year cutoff is better or worse than a one-year cutoff or a, or a one-day cutoff. Um, needless to say, we all know in this room that we have no idea how to classify Uber drivers. Are they employees? Are they not? Are they contractors? Are they not? Are they self-employed? Are they not? Um, and as a result, if measuring tenure and rotation was traditionally very hard, thinking about tenure and rotation in that world is much harder indeed. I have no answers. I only have questions. But it seems to me that, uh, you know, I look at a cutoff of three years. Well, yeah, sure, three years, why not? But I could also say three days, you know. Um, if I've been working for Uber for three days, you know, I'm probably a, 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 an experienced Uber driver. Um, so this probably requires some uh, rethinking. Um, how many hours a week do you have to work uh, to feel that you're being uh, um, mistreated and have, you know, poor quality of life and 
poor work-life balance. Well, if you've been following the Chilean debate, this is, of course, what's the debate that's raising in Chile nowadays. Uh, um, uh, let me make two points about this. One, which is the detail, um, you know, you, you qualify a, 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 a nexus of work as something over 45 hours. Well, 45 hours is the legal limit in Chile today. Um, so uh, the fact that somebody's working 45 hours doesn't mean very much because that person is, in fact, uh, doing what the law uh, uh, provides for. So in the case of Chile, I'm not sure that a 45-hour um, uh, threshold is very informative. And it is not surprising, of course, that Chile is very bad precisely in this category because that's exactly where the legal threshold is. And um, there's a, you know, a big debate nowadays in Chile as to whether we should go down to, to 30. Now, of course, if Labour wins the UK election, we'll go back to know, 35, is it, or 25, or 22, I'm not quite sure. So, you know, these are very much open issues. Uh, one issue that is very relevant for Chile, and I don't mean to be flip about this, is that in an economy with a big mining sector and a big agricultural sector and a big natural resource sector, these numbers don't mean anything at all. Because, and of course, in, you know, if you work in mining, you don't work a 45 or 40 or 35 hour a week. You work you know, seven days up in the mountain and you work seven days off in the mountain, you know, sort of off the mountain. Uh, and the same is true for agricultural workers. You know, when you know, you're picking apples, you're picking apples you know, 12 hours a day, seven days a week for the short season during which you pick apples, and then you probably don't work at all. So um, again, if we think of labor as being homogeneous and everybody works in an office, you know, these measures make a lot of sense. If a good chunk of your labor force is either picking apples or, or mining copper uh, up in the Andes at 4,000 meters above sea level, I'm not quite sure what these things mean, right? Uh, and again, in Chile, there's a raging debate and much of Latin America because natural resources are, are big. Uh, um, and uh, the employment patterns follow the structure of production. The structure of production is very much geared toward natural resource production, whether in mining or fishing or agriculture. And in that context, the standard work week of either 40 or 45 uh, hours makes no, no, very little sense. So it's not quite clear exactly how we measure these things. Last but not least, my other doubt is somewhat more substantive, and I want to go back to one of your slides. Can I? Sure. Um, uh, all right. So let me see if I can find that one that I am. Um... Yes, this is my uh, this is my my slide. Okay. Uh, if I, you know, this is uh, a, 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 a picture in which uh, on the horizontal axis we have. Um, a measure of quality of employment, uh, and then on the vertical axis we have the employment rate. Um, so countries with high quality of employment are also uh, countries in which you have a low employment rate, uh, right? Um, um, not, necessarily. Hmm? not necessarily. Why not? Well, I mean, if you if I were if I to put in a, a regression line, you'd have a positive slope, right? You know, yes, we have a couple of legs down here. Uh, probably the fit wouldn't be very good, right? Uh, the point I'm trying to make is this: that um, what you measure here is the quality of employment for those who are employed, and uh, there is nothing worse. The worst quality of employment that you can have is to have no job at all. Of course, if you choose to be unemployed, that's one thing, but I suspect a lot of people who today are not in the labor force in Latin America are not in the labor force, not simply because they you know, want to stay home and watch Netflix, but simply because there are a number of reasons that keep them away from the labor force. Um, uh, in fact, if, in, in, I, I know the Chilean case fairly well. If you, do, you look at survey data, how come you're not working, um, the number one reason is you know, I'm a mother and I have no place to leave my kids because daycare is, uh, is very... Uh, scarce. Uh, number two reason is, um, well, I have an elder, elderly relative and I stay home to take care of that person. And number uh, three reason is it's not worth it for me to work because my job is really far away and I spent two hours going to work and two hours coming back. So there are many people who are involuntarily outside the labor force. Um, now, um, if we're really going to think about the quality of employment, we need to put those people in, in the sample, right? Because they wish they would be employed, but they cannot be because of some failure of the uh, uh, structure of the labor market. And this is a policy implication, because it could well be, uh, I'm going to say something that is somewhat politically incorrect, but I hope not entirely silly, it could well be that you could have more employment for people like them at the expense of lower quality of employment. So there is maybe a meaningful policy trade-off here. 
Uh, but the policy trade-off is not across those who are employed, it's between those who are unemployed, even with bad jobs, and those who are not employed at all. Uh, and if we're going to think seriously about policy, that is one dimension of the trade-off we cannot leave uh, outside. Uh, I don't know whether, you know, this picture suggests that there is such a trade-off, right? But, but uh, you know, clearly if I do a, uh, put a regression line through here, the R square is going to be like, you know, 0.5 or something, so it's not a really, really firm one. But, um, but uh, this is a big issue because maybe you could have, you know, precarious job for, you know, for, say, women who can work part-time because, you know, granny is at home and there's no uh, other source of care for granny, but maybe precarious work for that woman is better than no work at all, right? Uh, and I think if we're going to take policy seriously, we have to worry about that. Okay, those are my, my doubts. Now let me get uh, into policy implications. Um, let me first say that, uh, um, that Kirsten is absolutely right in claiming that there are certain policy debates uh, that are nearly meaningless if you don't think about the structure of the labor market and the quality of employment. And the biggest area in which that debate is nearly meaningless is pensions. Um, uh, as you're probably aware, in much of Latin America, especially those countries that have, um, you know, individual capitalization pension system, there's a huge debate about, you know, have these systems failed, have they not, etc. And of course, you know, Chile being the poster child for both, you know, the alleged success of the system and also the extent to which people hate the system passionately because it does not provide very good pensions. Um, and of course, Chile right now is about to undertake yet another reform of that system. Well, you presented some very sophisticated evidence. Let me, let me put the uh, matter to you somewhat more crudely and bluntly. On average, people who retire today in Chile have 20 years of contributions, on average. And that's somewhat misleading because men have something like 28 and women have about 12. Um, okay, and that yeah, gives you about 20. Uh, if you think that in theory you join the labor force at, at 25 and you retire at 65, you ought to have 40 years of contributions. So the average person who's retiring today has contributed to only half, during half his or her active working life. In addition, because longevity has gone up massively, if you're a woman who retires at 65 today, conditional on being 65, your expected um, duration of life is 90, 89.5, okay? So you contributed for 20 years, 10% of your income, and you're going to be drawing from your savings for 25 years, and you expect to get 70% of your last wage. You know, put that on an Excel sheet, calculate the implicit rate of return that would be necessary for that system to come together, and the implicit rate of return is something like 50%, okay? And uh, clearly there's no real return of 50% uh, on any asset that I know of in the world. If, you know, if, such a thing existed, we wouldn't be here. We would all have Caribbean islands and we'd be sort of sitting in the sun and having a good time, right? So the low density of contributions coupled to the lengthening of life uh, uh, horizons is the key reason why pensions in Chile are low. This is not exactly what is at the center of the debate because you know, it is much nicer and politically much more fruitful to say that pension fund administrators are crooks, which they may or may not be, but clearly that's not what is at stake in the source of bad pensions. And what happens, of course, is that every reform that gets proposed is a reform about how much, what share of wages you should put into your pot. And Chile has 10 today, and it's a reform that says maybe we will, in fact, uh, deposit 14% of wages, maybe 15% uh, every month. That is going to be great news for the few people who contribute regularly. And for the vast majority who don't contribute regularly because they don't have regular jobs, that reform is going to be largely irrelevant. So this is a classic case in which, you know, the political system is barking up the wrong tree. And it is not because of ignorance, it's because of politics. Because to delve into this is to delve into a political morass. And most politicians say, oh, no, no, quality of, you know, labor policies, you know, oh, no, too messy. Let's just increase the contribution rates, which, believe me, is going, in fact, to increase inequality because those who have steady jobs are the ones with pretty good pensions already, right? Um, so they will have even better pensions. Uh, and those who don't have steady jobs will continue to have very low pensions uh, unless, of course, the government comes in and subsidizes them. So this is a case in which the problem is fairly self-evident and the political uh, answer to that self-evident problem has nothing to do with the actual nature of the problem, a complete and total policy failure. Um, that is also true of much of the debate about inequality in Latin America. And let me just uh, use another picture here. Um, uh, yes, this is um, 
I wrote a book in which, which is really all about this, this picture. Uh, you know, this, um, my data was 10 years old, this is brand new. Um, I think that once you look at this picture, and I invite everybody in this room to spend 30 seconds looking at this picture, you will realize why so much of the debate on inequality in Latin America is completely and totally barking up the wrong tree. Um, look at the blue um, bars. Uh, this is, again, my skinny little country, or our skinny little country of Chile. Um, if you happen to be in the top decile, your employment rate is 76%. If you happen to be in the bottom decile, your employment rate is 37%. And this is across genders. If you happen to be a woman who happens to be in the bottom decile, your employment rate is something like 15%. 15%, okay? So out of 100 women in the bottom decile, 15 are employed, okay? If you begin to do a decomposition of the Chilean Gini between variations in, in uh, Gini per household, and you look at differences in wages and differences in access to employment, you will not be surprised that with that variation across deciles, at least half of the bad genie of a country like Chile does have nothing to do with wages, it has everything to do with employment. To put it more provocatively, if you go to Chile's richest municipality, the municipality of Itacura, the average household has three jobs, because they're two parents, they both work, and a son or a daughter works. If you go to the, purest, the poorest municipality in the Santiago metropolitan region, the average household has not 0.4 jobs. Okay? So off the bat, before you look at uh, any differences in wages, uh, the rich household has six times more hours worked than the poor household. And you know, plug that into any model of how the genie uh, gets computed, or if you want to do you know, the ratio of the top decile to the bottom decile, or the ratio of the top quintile to the bottom quintile, are you going to find that almost, you know, at least half, and sometimes two thirds of the variation in household income has to do with this. And again, the political system never talks about this. Why? Because it's a political morass. Because if you get into this, you are going to be thinking about things that sometimes will step on the toes of prominent business people, and sometimes will step on the toes of prominent union people. And because politicians don't like to do either, this is mostly uh, ignored. So again, a lot of the distributional debate is completely barking off, you know, up the wrong tree. Two more thoughts, and I will stop uh, on policy implications. Um, Kristen has an, a, a very provocative statement at some point in the paper, which I'm not sure I agree with. She says, with this structure of the labor market and with this very low quality of employment, active labor market policies are impossible. That's, you know, that's as bold as it gets, right, in economics writing. Um, um, I wasn't quite sure where she, whether she meant impossible or whether she meant indispensable or inevitable, meaning, I think of a labor market policy that is active as a labor market policy that couples two things. On the one hand, fairly generous uh, unemployment insurance, so that if you happen to lose your job, you don't happen to lose your income, but at the same time, uh, training and uh, capacitation and all kinds of things that in fact get you back to the labor market and get you back to employment very quickly. So it seems to me that if this is the starting point, you know, Scandinavian type active labor market policies are exactly what you want to do. They're going to be very expensive, of course, because, you know, on average people have long unemployment spells, and so, the, you know, Chile spends about not 03 not 04 percent of GDP on active labor market policies. You do a back of the envelope calculation, and if you're going to go Scandinavian, you're going to have to spend like two points of GDP. So it's going to cost you a lot of money. So expensive, yes, it is. But is it useful? I would be inclined to say that, in fact, it is very useful. Uh, perhaps absolutely inevitable. Two more thoughts, and I will stop. Unemployment insurance. Yes, you're absolutely right that in Chile, given current rules, a lot of people uh, are not eligible to collect unemployment insurance because the bulk of the insurance is for people with, on permanent contracts, not for people on um, uh, contracts of fixed duration. Nothing prevents you from loosening up those rules. In fact, they have been loosened up already. I know this because when I was a minister, I drafted a bill is actually to loosen them up. I think what happened in Chile uh, is that a system of unemployment insurance was produced 15 years ago. Uh, no country in Latin America had ever had unemployment insurance, so we had, we had no idea, I say we because I was one of the economists consulted on this, on exactly what the parameters of, of the system ought to be like, you know, how the labor market would react. So, you know, the economists who were mostly working at the Ministry of Finance were very worried about the fiscal cost of this, designed a system which was very tight, meaning it was very restrictive in who had access to 
you know, the, the solidarity part, to redistribute uh, uh, social insurance type, type of uh, unemployment insurance, not simply drawing the money out of your own pot. Over time, there have been several reforms which have been loosening up these, uh, you know, these requirements, and the numbers you showed uh, suggest that they're still too tight. Uh, but, you know, give me 20 minutes, I'll draft you a bill that says, you know, I will change the conditions for access to the uh, solidarity pot, and more people, more than 5%, uh, will have access to that. So, you know, that's low-hanging fruit, right? That's, mm -hmm. that's easy to do. There's nothing wrong with the system as such, is that you have certain rules for access, you know, you can change those rules, takes five minutes, uh, done deal, that's fairly easy to fix. Last but not least, you uh, issue a call for replacing conditional cash transfers with a negative income tax systems, and I think that is absolutely and totally right. I think uh, conditional cash transfers get a lot of very good press, but uh, uh, that press is really justified when you have very low-income countries with very bad labor markets in Central America or Mexico, that's probably a great idea. In middle-income countries, conditional cash transfers are really uh, a lot of hot air. What you really need is EITC. Of, um, Chile has uh, such a system, uh, Uruguay has such a system, Colombia has it, South Africa has it. Uh, again, in their infancy, very small. I think there's a lot of room for uh, uh, doing more of that. It is fiscally expensive, but it is probably the best thing that you could do. So please go out and sell that idea because it's a very good idea indeed. Okay, thank you. Great, thanks. <laughs> okay, so we've, we've got time for a few questions. Um, have we got mics? Yeah. So who, can, I, can I just respond very quickly? Oh, to you want to respond first? Yeah, yeah, do, do a two minute response. All right. <laughs> It's getting exciting now. <laughs> <laughs> so just to come back to your um, questions about the definitions and the cutoff lines, the great job rotation, the hours worked, etc. Um, I think the answer to your query is in what you said initially. Um, these are measures defined for lack of a better alternative. Right. So there are severe data restrictions that I have to deal with. Um, it took us about two years roughly to homogenize this data and be able to do this calculation. And we can't, unfortunately, take account of specific circumstances. Um, so this is really, as you said, um, there, there are no better alternatives that we can work with at the moment. In an ideal world, I would love to have them. We have a paper on Central America that has more variables and therefore has also other dimensions included. Um, it's not necessarily a better paper because there are problems with including more dimensions and more exceptions, etc. as well. So this is a very, very um, summarized version of or a summarized method which inevitably has these kind of flaws. Um, the active labor market policies that you referred to, I completely agree, they are not just only a useful um, way out of this conundrum, but also a necessary one. My point is really the following, if you have workers who are rotating so frequently, who have such precarious types of contracts, those are also the workers who most need the active labor market policies. And they're the hardest workers to get hold of. Um, it is impossible to train somebody to the requisite level of skills in a short period of time. In a labor market that rotates so frequently, employers who would have to provide some of that training will then go on to lose their workers, which is a very different, difficult um, uh, situation because then employers will only train up to the minimum levels um, necessary for a worker to function and not beyond that. So there are many policies, for example, paying workers um, a wage so that they can retrain and, and acquire more sophisticated skills that I think need to be considered. The problem is rolling them out on a massive enough scale to have a big impact and also getting those vulnerable workers that this indicator indica identifies and targeting them at them because those are the workers that institutions simply aren't set up to deal with. Just very but, you know, but the Scandinavians do it. Um, well, yeah, but they don't have a lot of money. Market like yeah, this, and yeah. they have a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, theoretically, yeah. Um, difficult in practice. Yeah. Okay, good. Let's, let's open it up to questions. And maybe, maybe give me running about 10 minutes left. Maybe we should take two or three uh, in a chunk. You, you had your hand up very fast over there. Go on, you're first. Hi. Uh, well, many thanks for uh, your clear presentation. I'm sure that the, this approach can lead to better social policies connected with labor market. But well, my questions, uh, my question regards to the role of unions. Mm -hmm. So, particularly, yes, thank you. <laughs> I mean, did you consider in your 
including this variable in your approach and your measurement? Thank okay, you. Let's take, let's take two more and then the speakers can respond. Um, hi, thanks as well for your presentation. Um, my question regards to would you think it's possible to include, and if so, how, um, a component regarding, I don't know how to call it, but let's say like the, the quality of the legal labor um, institutions in the country. Um, mm -hmm. I, I ask this for, for two reasons. For example, in, in Colombia, fixed term contracts, you're like um, companies or the public sector, you could be maximum for three years and fixed term contracts, and after that you have the right to be employed on an indefinite contract. This usually never happens, and there's no institution like uh, supervising this, and um, the, what's really scandalous, I think, is that this usually happens more in the public sector as well, so uh, there might be some conflict there, and also because of pensions. Um, so people in general, with the number of hours that they've worked and contributed to, at the end of their working life, they, sometimes they find out that there are hours missing. And when they try to entail legal action um, to correct this, sometimes it takes many years and people usually either die <laughs> because they're old and they never get their legal case solved. So, so the, like, um, my question on the legal institutions is like twofold. One, like supervision that, that the quality of employment is being at least to what the law says it should be and then on how to solve um, queries related to the quality of employee, like to your rights as an employee. Okay, good. So that's two questions about labor market institutions. What's Mike going to ask? Thank, thanks, Mike. I'm, so I'm Mike Savage. I'm director of the II. I feel thrilled that you're doing this work within, within our uh, ranks, so to speak. And being a sociologist, I've got, got this interesting um, uh, question about you know, I really like what you're trying to do. I'm trying to think about how we, how we bring employment back into the debates about inequality, because it has been a bit missing. I mean, there is this work in sociology around occupational class schemas. Um, and, you know, the, a very powerful approach to the one used by John Goldthorpe and his colleagues, which, you know, I've been debating with for many, many years. And I don't really like it, but nonetheless, what he tries to do is he tries to think about classes in terms of, in a way, the quality of employment, although he doesn't use those terms, which, so he... He, differ he differentiates people on what he calls a labor contract, where you're, you're getting a discrete reward for work done, which could be hourly paid or it could be weekly paid, versus people on what he calls a service, service relationship, where you're in this more, uh, I think the word he uses, you have more expertise, more autonomy at work. Um, it's a kind of primary labor market in the kind of economist's terms. And in a way, that might be interesting to think about how it relates to, to what you're doing, because, you know, it, it does bear upon the issue about how many people in different countries are, particularly in this kind of service relationship, professional managerial people, where you might say they're kind of, to some extent at least, brought out of the public, public policy issue because the, the company is looking after them, or to some extent might, might be looking after them in terms of sick pay and um, pension contributions and so forth. So whether there's a way of thinking about how debates about occupational class may also relate to what you're trying to do here. Okay, so we, I'm, I'm going to abuse my privilege as chair and ask one thing. So the thing I thought was striking about this chart was actually the other countries, mm -hmm. which is Paraguay and yeah, Bolivia exactly. at the top, How flat they are. Have, which is yeah. incredible. You yeah. don't see that in any countries you really look at. Mm. Um, in I, which leads you to one that about the quality of the data. Yeah, yeah. 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 That, that's the uh, typical, you can't afford to be unemployed or... Yeah, yeah, yeah but, it's, but it's yeah. so flat. I mean, it's amazing. Yes. Yeah. 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 The same with the unemployment rate, which was uh, yeah. very, very similar. Of course, not the quality of employment. Right. So that, 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 that's where this is very different. Mm, right. Um, as well. Yeah. But in, 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 the, in the very low-income countries, that is both formal, informal. Okay. So, so somebody selling fruit on the street in La Paz qualifies as employed. Yes. Yeah. So that's part but, of the reason. They right. also yeah. do. Yeah. They qualify yeah. as employed yeah. in Chile. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They also qualify as employed in Chile. Right, but the share of those people is it's, much it's larger yeah. in, in Bolivia than in Chile. Okay, I'm going to try and respond to the questions in the interest of time rather succinctly. Um, the quick answer to the union's question is yes, I have thought about it. Um, you cannot compare 
data on unions to include it in the indicator because it's not comparable across countries with the data sets that we have at the moment. Also, unions are an issue that only affect formal workers, mostly. There are some associations of uh, taxi drivers, etc., as well, um, but on average, it's a, it's a, it's a formal labour force issue. So what I've done is I've studied unions in relationship to the quality of employment. And we definitely get results there that show that unionized workers have better quality jobs than non-unionized workers. But that is completely also an intuitive result because larger companies have unions, um, higher income workers have unions, etc. So, so that it's not really a, a, a very novel conclusion. I think the big point with regard to unions here is that unions have been completely absent from the quality of employment debate. Okay. So unions have been undermined by this process of worsening quality of employment because, again, workers who are rotating as frequently as many of these workers do will not generally unionize. And so it reduces their, number of member their, their levels of membership, it also reduces their overall power, and there has been no country that I know of where at the national level unions have entered or, or put this issue onto the agenda. And when you tell them about it, first of all, they're not aware of the data. Um, if they are aware of it, it's just simply not um, their obvious sort of political field of interaction. Mm -hmm. And so uh, unions, as a result, are not only absent on this quality of employment debate, but also as a result, they are very much absent from all the other debates, whether the pension reform, other uh, yeah. social protection systems, etc. Can I can I add one mm -hmm. one sentence anecdote to that? I remember bringing up this issue in the context of trying to legislate uh, an EITC in Chile in a discussion with one of the most senior labor people. Uh, you know, we'd had a bottle of wine, so we were being frank. Uh, uh, he looked at me and he said, why do you want to do this? And I said, because of course it will create jobs for those who don't have jobs. And he looked at me and he said, why should I care? Those people will never vote for me because they will be in sectors that will never be unionized. So the political economy is very nasty. Um, uh, you know, standard unions tend to be either in the state sector or in the industrial sector. Chances are people at the very bottom of the job scale will never be in those two sectors. And these are, most unions really couldn't care less. Yes, that's very much very true. There's a very much an inside-outsider phenomenon here. Sure. Um, however, that's no excuse for governments not to put this onto the agenda and to, to see the implications of this. Regarding the legal framework, um, there are two components to your answer. The first and very simple one is that at the moment there's absolutely no data or information on Latin America to do a sort of a study of this that you could include in an indicator. There are, however, indicators of legal frameworks and uh, regulation labor market flexibility and the sort of typical doing business indicators um, that exist. But uh, there's nothing at the moment that I can, could include in an indicator such as this if I wanted to. Now, the other point is I don't really want to because <laughs> the, um, this sounds a bit glib, but the issue here is really this is a methodology designed to look at individual workers and therefore I'm looking at sort of the lowest common denominator because I'm trying to identify my most vulnerable workers and the workers that as a public policy maker and that from a public policy perspective I most need to be concerned about. Um, this is, and, and, and legal frameworks are often included in the plethora of indicators that exist on decent work, etc. So among those 52 indicators that the ILO lists, there are indicators on legal frameworks. The problem is that they don't apply to the entire labor force. Um, they are very much macro level indicators where, where they do exist, so they don't really help from this policy making perspective. It's a bit like if you want to evaluate the quality of, your, of, of the people driving a car, whether, they're, you know, whether they have accident rates or how they behave as drivers in, in the roads. You don't really, you, you look at the drivers, but not in the, in the overall road infrastructure in which they're moving. Yeah. So I prefer when it comes to quality of employment indicators to not mix levels. So either micro indi uh, indicators, micro indicators, legal indicators, they should be treated as separate. Um, and th that's also relevant to one of the comments that, that uh, Andres made. Um, it's not that I don't think that people who are inactive, for example, mm -hmm. need the opportunity to participate in the labor market isn't an issue. I do think that that's very much an issue as these um, inequality graphs show. I think the issue is that I would look at them as a separate indicator. So that's where the traditional indicators of inactivity unemployment and so on come in and policies should be directed at them too. So quality of employment doesn't mean to the exclusion of everything else. 
Um, so use separate indicators for that kind of thing. With regard to the occupation, um, occupational class systems, uh, Mike, your question, there's a tremendous lag in Latin America with regard to this kind of literature. And we're only just sort of trying to get through some of the more basic class, social class um, characterizations and descriptions, etc., and understanding of how class uh, has changed or is established, etc. Um, I can't think of anyone who has looked at it at the moment from a, from a labor market perspective. Um, it would require a completely different, set, set, a set, a different study, um, which I haven't at the moment come across. That doesn't mean, of course, that it isn't a very interesting question to ask. Um, but I'm, I'm not certain that people... You see, the, the, these labor markets are so fluid that I'm not sure that people identify with a particular social class through their job. So this isn't something that I have studied. Um, I'm kind of like talking off the top of my head here. Um, but there's not that same, except for sort of certain economic sectors, miners, for example, agricultural workers maybe. Um, but it's not something that um, I think people generally use as a way to sort of identify who they are and define who they are from a class perspective. Okay, great. I'm, I'm afraid we've run out of time. Uh, and I did miss one of my announcements I was make, meant to make at the start. So for, for, for anybody who's interested in Chile and Latin America more generally, there's gonna, actually going to be a two-day conference on the 27th and 28th uh, entitled Inequalities, Conflict and Change, Perspectives and Cases from Latin America. There will be a keynote address by uh, the one and only Mike Savage on the challenge of inequality um, and a panel discussion on current events and social protests in Chile on the 28th. So if anybody's interested in that, uh, that that's also an event that's, that's going to be on. So I think we should just thank the speakers for a uh, great contribution. <laughs>